will search for yours. Let me be to you a sacrifice. And I will praise you, Lord. And I will sing the come down. And as you show your face, we'll see. dead battery here. Uh, maybe some of you were expecting to see Wayne up here this morning, and uh, he is with his wife where he should be. Uh, Michelle had her surgery this week, and we went to see her a couple times, and praise the Lord, she is doing way better than what she was supposed to be doing, uh, but she is still at home recovering, and so he's by her side where he should be. I just want to uh, draw your minds to, to this question this morning. What is your picture of God? Because whatever your picture of God is, is going to drastically affect what your response is to God. We've come here together this morning to worship together. Uh, presumably, we've been worshiping throughout the week, but this is our time to do that together. But there's so many pictures about God that are floating around out there. Uh, last night, we had a, a Bible study at Jordan's house, and we were just trying to get to the heart of this issue. Who is God? Do you believe that your God is beautiful in the extreme? That he loves you unconditionally and that you can come to him with any problem or any sorrow or any burden at any moment and he will accept you unconditionally. That is the God that we serve. He doesn't, he doesn't force us into this place this morning. He doesn't compel us. He just shows us a picture of himself and he says, I hope that that's going to be enough. This is all that I'm going to do. Show you my loving heart, and that I, I'm hoping will draw you to me. As we focus on him this morning, we will be drawn to him because he is a beautiful God and because his heart for you is unconditional love. I'm going to invite you guys this morning to come up and join me in a, a circle of prayer. As we invite God to speak to our hearts, as we invite him to uh, heal our hearts this morning, uh, feel free to, to begin making your way up as we sing a, our last uh, refrain. And I will praise you, Lord. And I will sing the love Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with hearts wide open. Lord, we're acknowledging and accepting the pain, the burdens, the things that we cannot overcome on our own, the sinfulness in our hearts, the things we're attracted to. Lord, we are slaves to. But you have promised that if we come to you and lay those things at your feet, that you would give us freedom, freedom from ourselves, freedom from the pain, freedom from the sickness and from the disease. Lord, each one this morning has something uh, in their heart that is their mountain this week. But Lord, you told us that by your power and in faith as we speak to those mountains, you will move them out of the way. And so Lord, we have come to you this morning appealing for that kind of power in our hearts and in our lives. We've come to you to uh, accept the love that our Heavenly Father has for us. Lord, we, we thank you. We're grateful. And as we 
open our hearts in worship this morning. We ask and pray that your Holy Spirit would meet us here and that we would leave here changed and transformed by the power of your love and by the power of your touch. Father, please speak to us this morning those things which you desire to share. And if Wayne were here this morning, I would, I would like to pray in spirit with him that you would let nothing in my life get in the way of what you want to share with your children this morning, the beautiful gifts that you have for them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe you're all to us. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe you're all to us. church let the righteousness of god be a holy flame that burns let the saving love of christ be the measure of our lives we believe you're all to us only son church let the righteousness of god be a holy flame that burns let the saving love of christ be the measure of our lives we believe you're all to us you're all to Jesus, you 
are all to us. beautiful thought just occurred to me imagine that um, during the week every week every weekday that your bank account was just barely hanging on at zero it's like you were just barely making your payments barely getting your groceries and maybe you had like a stipend that was coming in daily and it was just hardly staying afloat but then one day a week, somebody comes along and on that day injects a million dollars into just that day, once a week. But after that day's over, he takes it back, whatever you didn't spend. <laughs> but then go through that whole week again, and then finally get, you're always looking forward to that one day where it's just going to be poof, injection that you can do whatever you want. That's kind of how I feel as I'm thinking about it this Sabbath with my time. It's like, Time during the week, uh, maybe you guys don't have this problem. I'm sure some of the, the students can relate. Time during the week is scarce, few, far between. But it's like every week God has given me the gift of one day a week where he's like injecting the time into my day to invest in things that really matter. And I love that. I'm thankful to be here together with you on Sabbath. I'll ask you to turn with me this morning to Ephesians chapter 5 for our opening verse. Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5, we're looking at verses 13 and 14. And it says, But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you life. He'll give you light. <laughs> Jesus has the power to speak life into the dead. thought there might be a few, few more amens in that. Jesus has power to speak life into the dead. Amen. amen. We're going to look at three stories today, maybe four. The first one's found in Luke chapter 7. You can begin turning there if you like. It starts in verse 11, but I'm really going to be paraphrasing the story for you. Jesus had just spent the night in Capernaum and I believe that he had had a good night because that day prior to he had had an encounter with this Roman centurion who, as he put it, exhibited more faith than anything that he had found in Israel. And I believe his spirit was refreshed by that. So that night as he was laying down, I think he was going, yes. He knew that there was this person in Capernaum who he could now leave this area and he knew that there was a seed planted that was going to keep working and sprouting in that area and I, I, I think Jesus is brilliant how he did that he couldn't be all places at all times but he kept going from one place planting seeds another place planting seeds he kept moving throughout the area planting seeds knowing that eventually the, the disciples would come through and that harvest would just explode so I, I think that he's brilliant in that way but I believe he was rejoicing that night the next day he thought it's time to move on. I've got to go to a different place. And the Bible says that he decided he was going to go to the town of Nain. So I got kind of curious. These towns are still there in, in our modern uh, Google Maps. I've never been there, but I, I take on faith that Google Maps is correct. I go over and look at Capernaum, and I trace the route to Nain. How far is that? How, how far is Jesus going to walk that day? And on Google Maps, you can put the, the walking feature, right? How long would it take to walk this? Ten hours. A ten-hour walk from Capernaum to Nain. Capernaum was uh, just north of the Sea of Galilee, and Nain was a small town south of that. But not only was it just Jesus going to be making the walk, it said that a crowd wanted to go with him. And this is one of the first takeaways I get from this story, is that Jesus is enjoyable to be around. Amen? Uh, people were like, what, what is that? How far are you going? Ten mile walk? Can I come? You know? It's like they just wanted to be in his presence. I, so I, I 
did the same thing over here at what would be a, an equivalent 10 mile walk in our region and it looked like about to St. Bonnie, if you're familiar with that between here and the cities, St. Boniface would be about a, a 10 hour walk, not 10 mile, 10 hour walk. So after church I was thinking maybe I'll just try it, walk to, to uh, St. Bonnie. Is anybody with me? No takers? All right, well, Jesus is more popular than me, but that, that's fine with me. So this whole crowd, they wanted to go with him. So I imagine it would take even a little longer moving with women and children, but throughout the day, they were moving as like a herd across the plains, kind of rolling plains of Palestine on their way to Nain. So it would have had to have been pretty late by the time they actually started getting there. They made this trip, it sounds like, in a day. But as the crowd that was following the giver of life approached Nain, they were met with a crowd who was following a victim of death. And so the happy conversations and um, the joyful experiences that were going on in this crowd all of a sudden came into collision with the mourning and the sobbing and the wailing and the pain of another crowd, these two crowds moving together. Now amidst that, that crowd of sorrow and pain, there was a mother a mother who was following a silent casket of her last living, not anymore, son. The Bible says this woman was a widow, which means this was her last, her last heir, her last connection. And if you think about this, in a patriarchal culture like they had, how, how devastating it could be to be a single widow woman on your own. I mean, she was looking ahead to a life that was going to be uh, loneliness, depravity, uh, insecurity. But I believe all that was eclipsed in the moment as she was just following this silent box, just wailing herself of, of following her son to his cold grave. But I love what, what, what the Bible says when it, see it, when it depicts Jesus coming in contact with this crowd. It's not that he just went around doing this everywhere, but he saw that woman, and the Bible says in, in the New International Version, his heart went out to her. He just couldn't take it. It was like he saw the pain, it was just too much. He just, he couldn't let this be. And so amidst all the crying and the confusion, the, the sorrow, all of a sudden she hears this voice. <clears throat> A strange thing to say in, in a time like this, she hears this voice of calm and confidence, do not weep. Do not weep. In a moment like this, who has the audacity to come up to you and say, do not weep? But as she opened her eyes and saw this face of love and confidence, I imagine something inside her sparked hope against hope as both crowds go silent. And now they're all fixed on Jesus. Whoa. What does he think he's going to do? He's making his way over to this quiet box. But as he came close, lays his hand on the box, those words, as it's everybody's hushed and watching him, young man, arise. And there was something remembered that day which had long been forgotten, which was, Jesus has power to speak life into the dead. Amen? Amen. Amen. That was Luke 7. Story number two. Remember, we're doing three, maybe four. Story number two is in Luke 8. Starts in verse 40. Once again, Jesus is being pressed. It says, nearly crushed by a crowd of followers who is all wanting to be near him. This is the experience where the woman presses through the crowd just to even touch his garment. He's like, uh, who, uh, somebody touched me. I felt the power go out. Peter's like, somebody touched you. We're all crushing you. But the reason that crowd was slowly on the move is because as Jesus had come back across the lake, he was met by what, was, what we're told is the ruler of the synagogue in that area, uh, Jairus, a man of high profile and high power. He was used to being the influential one, the one that people looked up to. And he was, he was used to that kind of power. He was used to that position. 
But over the last few weeks, as he had been spending time by the deathbed of his his 12-year-old daughter who was slowly losing life and slowly losing breath, all of a sudden the man of power did not feel so powerful. And so when he had heard hopes of, of things that Jesus had been doing, healing the sick, uh, chasing away demons, he thought this might be my only hope. And so he did what a man of power is rare to do. Because of his dying daughter, he humbled himself and went to Jesus seeking help and probably didn't even know what to really expect. But this, this was his last chance. So that crowd, they're all, all together making their way to this ruler's house. And on the way there, they're all of a sudden met with a message of devastation. A messenger came out and said, your daughter's dead. You don't need to trouble the teacher anymore. Now, I don't know who here is a parent who has lost a child. Only you can probably fully understand what those words mean. I hope I never have to hear them. But in that crushing moment where all of his world was just falling apart, nothing around him matters. When you hear those words, your daughter is dead, don't trouble the teacher anymore, everything goes tunnel vision. You don't see anything around you except for at the end of that tunnel, a face meets him. He looks to Jesus, and Jesus says these strange words, again, with peace and confidence. Just imagine hearing this. Don't be afraid. Only believe, and she will be made well. What? Who would say something like that in a moment like this? Don't be afraid. Just believe. She'll be made well. And in somewhat confusion now, the crowd not sure what to expect, continues to move towards that, that ruler's house. And as they get there, Jesus drives out all of the confusion and all of the wailing and all of the people who are mocking him and all of, all of the everything. Now it's just silent. The parents, three disciples, their eyes are on Jesus. What's he going to do? He makes his way to, to the bedside of that little girl. And then come those words that the parents are just waiting, bated breath in anticipation. What is he going to do? Little girl, arise. <laughs> and so there was witness something that day in Palestine, something that, which had long been dismissed, that Jesus has power to speak life into the dead. Amen. Amen? Is that an awesome promise to us today or what? More awesome the more people you lose, isn't it? Last story. <clears throat> Once again, we're looking upon a crowd of people. A crowd of mourners, a crowd of sorrow. It's actually this crowd um, who's weeping contributed to the shortest verse that we have in the Bible. Do you guys know what that is? Jesus wept. Yeah, we're at the tomb of Lazarus right now. I love what, what Desire of Ages says about this. Listen, listen to her commentary on this moment. It was not only because of the scenes that were before him that Christ wept. The weight of the grief of ages was upon him. He saw the terrible effects of the transgression of God's law. Looking down the years to come, he saw suffering and sorrow, tears and death that were to be the lot of man. His heart was pierced with pain of the human family in all the ages and all lands. Woes of the sinful race were heavy upon his soul, and the fountain of his tears was broken up as he longed to relieve all their distress. Are you guys thankful that that's what goes on in the heart of God in a moment of pain? Amen. Just a little more. She says, Jesus wept, quote, Though he was the Son of God, yet he had taken on human nature, and he was moved by human sorrow. His tender pitying heart was ever awakened to sympathy by suffering. He weeps for those who weep, 
and rejoices for those who rejoice. Isn't that an amazing picture to get of the God of the universe who is so above everything that he could very easily and very well be above us? But he, he decides not to do that. He comes down to our level. He feels our pain and our sorrow. And in those moments when you're hurting, God's heart is breaking. His eyes are watering. And he says, someday I'm going to make this right. So once again, we're back amidst that crowd, a crowd of grief, and probably no grief more bitter than that of the two sisters, Mary and Martha. As, I, as I'm reading this story, I'm just kind of trying to understand what would be going on in Martha's mind. She's the first one. She slips away to go talk to Christ. Now, she had been by the bedside of her dying brother knowing full well that, that Jesus could heal him, they trusted in that. They weren't afraid of that. But Jesus wasn't around at the time. So they had sent a message to him, Jesus, your friend, Lazarus, he's sick, he's dying, he needs your help. And they trusted that Jesus would come and solve the problem in his time. Now they were a little perturbed when the messenger came back without him, but he brought this message, do not fear, this sickness is not unto death. And so, in faith, those two sisters, were, their hearts were lightened by that. They said, okay, well, we have the promise. Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death. So I'm imagining what was going through their minds as Lazarus' last breaths were... <sighs> fading out. What, what was going on in their faith experience? What kinds of things were they thinking about? And so they had been through this now. Lazarus had been dead for many days. Jesus didn't come. The sickness is not unto death. And so you can almost sense the tension in Martha. She loves her Savior. She trusts her Savior. But as she comes to meet him in this crowd, you can almost sense the tension going on inside her own heart. She says, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother wouldn't have died but then the faith. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Do we have faith like that when, when Lazarus dies in our lives, when, when things go so wrong that it seems like it's completely counter to what God's word said? Can we still say, but God, whatever you desire, whatever your, your plan is, I trust I will, it will go forward. Jesus comforts her and says, Martha, don't worry. Your brother will rise again. I know he'll rise again, Lord. He'll, he'll come up in the resurrection. I know that. Jesus looks at her, Martha, who do you think is the source of the resurrection? He's standing right here in front of you. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. <clears throat> Do you believe that Jesus has power to speak life into the dead? Let me ask you this. Do you believe that Jesus has the power to speak life into a dead heart? Fourth story. This probably took place maybe around 2007, 2008. Wayne had suggested maybe I, I share some of my testimony, and I, I wasn't planning to share much of it. I'm trying to figure out where to jump in, but something had happened in Alyssa in my life that had caught our attention enough to make me aware of my own lukewarmness, and I was not satisfied. I'm like, God, I've been a Christian my whole life. I've been going through the motions. I've been going to church. I've been leading out in ministry things. I've been praying in front of people. I've been doing this, doing that, and I don't feel it. There's no life in me, no spiritual life. And I was finally coming to the point where I was just realizing that. I didn't know what to do about it. I was just realizing it, getting frustrated by it. I think, God, why am I so lukewarm, and how do I change that lukewarmness? That was becoming 
something bitter enough on my soul that there was a night, it was actually just in the neighborhood, uh, Con Diane owned the duplex, we were living there at the time, and um, this must have been a little later than 2008, must have been 2009. We were living there, uh, no, no, uh, Pastor Wayne was, and his wife were living there, so before we lived there, we were visiting them. And we were in the basement that night, and I, we were just having a conversation that, it was one of those conversations that kept going, kept going, and kept going, until all of a sudden you find yourself, you're talking about deep and personal things. And I found myself admitting to them just the, the struggle, the pain, the frustration that was on my heart, as I had been trying to seek spiritual life and didn't know how to experience it, where it comes from. Why am I so lukewarm, and how can I get over this? And so what Pastor... Pastor Wayne did with me that night was asked if he would, if I'd be willing for him to lead me in a prayer. I said, all right, let's do that. And as he began leading me in the prayer, I actually don't remember any of the things that he'd said in that prayer, except for that it came to a point where I was in tears. I was literally pretty much at the end of my rope, begging God, how do I stop being lukewarm? How can this ever change? Where does this ever switch? Where do I ever switch into spiritual life? And he, he said, he asked me to ask this question. God, would you show me a picture of my own heart? And in sincerity, I lifted that before God in my tears. I said, God, show me a picture of my own heart. And in that moment, a picture came to me, very clear. Uh, not something I was, I'd been thinking about, it just came to my mind. And I saw inside my own body, so to speak, I saw this heart, and it was just encrusted with stone. But in that stone, there's these cracks. They were throughout the stone, and, and through those cracks, light was trying to shine out. It was like God was saying, the spiritual life you've been seeking, I'm trying to put in you, but there's things you're keeping in the way. It's it's still covered. It's not shining forth as long as it stays covered in this stone. Now, what was the verse that we read at the beginning? It said, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. These were before I knew these Bible verses, but God was trying to put light in my heart, and I was keeping it covered in stone. All these things that I just didn't want to let go of or I wasn't ready for, you know? Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I didn't know that Bible verse at that time. It's like God was staying consistent with his word. He was showing me a picture of my own heart of stone. And so here we are, we're back with that crowd standing with Jesus in front of that tomb sealed, giant boulder. Does anybody remember what Christ said? Before that, he said, take away the stone. Lazarus, come forth. See, that stone has to be removed before the life can come forth. If Lazarus comes to life and he just hangs out in the tomb, that does him or nobody else any good. But there are those stones in our lives that we just keep hanging on to and we're not willing to let go. And we're saying, God, I want spiritual life. God, I want spiritual realness with you. I want a relationship with you. But I want, I'm just going to keep hanging on to this and to that and to this and to that. And beloved, I'm just here to tell you this morning that as long as you're hanging on to those things, you're going to be capping your own relationship with God. And once you let go of those things, it's not devastating, it's liberating. It's life-giving. I'm still on the journey. I'm still experiencing it day by day myself. And I hope you are as well. Take away the stone. Lazarus, come forth. Johnny, come forth. You, I, come forth. Christ has the power to speak life into the dead. Beloved, I hope that as you're coming here week by week and living your life day by day, that you're not just going through the motions of a Christian life. 
Because God is offering us something real, something actual that takes place in our heart. He said, I will prepare you. I will sanctify you. I will, I will complete you and prepare you for my second coming. And that's what we're here to be doing. To sharing the, mes- sharing the message of what he's going to do for us and accepting that message ourselves as we move forward in our Christian life. And so it may come to a point where you are on your knees pleading before God, saying, God, please bring spiritual life to me. God is saying, I will put that life there. You need to take away that stone and let's do this together. God loves you guys so much. He is coming right to the door and saying, I want to come in. I just need the invitation. Full, sincere invitation. I'm ready. I created you to be in intimacy with me. This whole sin thing is just separating us and it's screwing it up. But God has a very difficult job. He hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. And so we've had a lot of surgeries this week in our church. The surgeons were thankful that those knives can cut healingly and healthfully, right? And that they've done a good job. Christ has a, a difficult work to do. Remove the object of what he hates from the object of what he loves. We're the opposite. We love the sin and hate the sinner. But God is saying, no, I want you. I desire you. I desire intimate relationship with you. I love you. And we can do this. I can give you my victory. If Christ is alive in you, you will be liberated by that, not constrained by that. God loves you so much. Uh, I, I just invite you to come to the door of his knocking this morning and say, yes, Lord. As we pray together, I invite you to respond to him directly. Heavenly Father, Lord, from the coldness and the darkness from inside our own tombs, we hear you on the outside calling, come forth. Lord, for myself, I want to recommit to you again today as I need to every day, Lord, that I want to come to that call. And God, you are reading all hearts this, here this morning, and Father, you know our responses. Lord, I pray that you would hear and honor all of our responses this morning as we are answering that call, come forth to life. I will give you life. I will give you freedom. We thank you and praise you for being a loving God and for coming back for us and not leaving us in the condition that we're in, but you have a, a plan of eternity of love and peace for each one of us. We thank you and praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.